Yo, what is going on, bros? Welcome back to another one. And today we are assembling the block. Let's dive right in. Go back, 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 back. All right, so here is everything that we're gonna need. Firstly, we're gonna need, uh, in my case, I needed three packs of these Hastings piston rings. And uh, inside of each one of these has two sets of piston rings. Thus, three times two is six, so we get six sets. Then you end up with all these bags of piston rings and they have obviously labeled one top, two second, and then the two sets of oil rings. Then it comes with this nice little pamphlet uh, which is extremely helpful because up in here it tells you some things do and do not do these things and then down here it tells you how to uh, orient the piston rings and such. The other thing that we're going to need are these connecting rod bearings and we've also got uh, retainers for the wrist pins for the pistons. We're going to need engine assembly lube, motor oil, I don't have it sitting here next to me, tools. We're going to need a piston ring uh, grinder. We're going to need these piston ring expanders. We're going to need this feeler gauge, a feeler gauge. And a for this, I'm going to be using a roll of tape. I need to cut this lip off. Uh, but we're going to be using a roll of tape to put the piston ring inside of the block. We're going to set it in. And then we're going to use this roll of tape to slowly push it down. And we're going to look at the side and, and see if we can't line it up so that it's uh, nice and straight. And then you take your feeler gauge and then you go to the gap that's there and that's how you measure your ring gap. One thing that I forgot to mention that we're going to need is uh, this piston ring compressor here. Uh, so this is a 90 millimeter piston ring compressor and I actually gashed this up a little bit but it worked, not a problem. But blam, there it is. So to start this off, first thing I do is I take all of the top piston rings and I set them all into their cylinders. I use the roll of tape to push them down evenly. Once I'm confident I have the piston ring in there all the way flat, I then take a feeler gauge just to check where the piston rings are starting off at. And it turns out they were anywhere between 0 0.012 and 0 0.014 millimeters for the top ring. The second ring, if I'm not mistaken, was between 0 0.018 and 0 0.02. Then, one by one, I take a piston ring out and grind it and put it back in and check the gap again. I don't want to grind so far that I go over my mark. I want to make sure that I slowly creep up to my mark and then once I'm within plus or minus a couple percent of where I want to be, then I stop. Also, don't forget to use a file to file down the edges of your piston ring, otherwise there might be burrs on the edges of it and you can score the inside of the cylinder or the ring groove of the piston. My goal for the top ring was to reach a gap of about 0 0.06 millimeters. Um, all of my piston rings ended up within plus or minus 0 0.05 millimeters. They don't have to be perfect, but all within, you know, a close range of each other so that there's not a huge difference amongst cylinders. The second ring, the procedure is the same. However, in my case, the second ring has a dot indicating which direction it faces up. And so each time I put these rings into the block, I made sure to have it facing up. That said, I was aiming for a gap of around 0 0.07 millimeters for the second ring. You want this to be a little bit bigger so that it's easy for gases bypassing the top ring to go past the second ring so that there's no pressure that builds up between the two rings. And to install the piston rings, we're going to start with the oil ring. And in my case, with this style of oil ring, what you do is you spiral on the spacer, which is the S looking oil ring part. Then on top of that, towards the top of the piston, you take one of the retainer bands for the oil ring and you spiral that in over the top. And then you take the lower band and you spiral that on. Then you use your piston ring expander tool and you expand the second ring over the top of the piston down to the second ring groove. Then you expand your first ring over the top of the piston over to the top ring groove. And then you orient the second and top rings. Top ring facing front of the piston, second ring facing the back of the piston. And then the oil ring needs to be put on in the correct orientation because it's difficult to maneuver after it's on and the spacer needs to be facing the front, while the two flat bands need to be spaced one inch away from where the oil ring split meets. I hope that makes sense, it's difficult to describe. Follow the directions that come with your piston rings. 
Once all of my piston rings were on the pistons, I rinsed each piston with WD-40 just to make sure that any dust, any blast media that may have been left over from painting these, anything that could possibly be on the pistons is rinsed off with an oil right before it goes into the block. I do the same to the connecting rods, again, to make sure that there's no dust, any debris, anything, any abrasive material that might be on them that could fall into the oil. Next, I arrange each of the pistons and each of the connecting rods, starting from cylinder one back to cylinder six, so that they're all organized, along with the wrist pins as well. And then piston by piston, I use a paper towel to clean out the channels in the piston where the wrist pin goes, the channel in the connecting rod where the wrist pin goes, and then I wipe down the wrist pin to remove my Sharpie mark and to make sure there's no dust on it. After that, I use a little bit of assembly lube and I put it inside of each of the channels for the wrist pin and I wipe some on the wrist pin as well. Then I slide the wrist pin into the piston all the way up until the point where it would start sliding through the connecting rod. Then I take my connecting rod and put it into the piston at that point and then slide the wrist pin the rest of the way through. Otherwise, if you try to balance everything at the same time while you're trying to slide the wrist pin through, it gets difficult and, and it's, it's rough. So you want to slide the wrist pin in first, then take your connecting rod and put it into the piston and slide the wrist pin the rest of the way through. A general rule of thumb with this engine, if you're unsure of which direction something faces, look and see which side of the part the marks are and that's most likely going to be the front. For example, the connecting rods. The back side of the connecting rods don't have any marks on them. The front have a whole bunch of marks on them. That's the front of the connecting rod that faces the front of the engine. Just like the piston, if you notice, the Mercedes logo is on the front of the piston, and on the back there's just some casting marks. So make sure that you're getting the correct connecting rod onto the correct piston with the correct wrist pin, and that they're all facing front. This is critical. It may not be too big of a deal if you mixed up your wrist pins, but if I'm not mistaken, from the factory, these are balanced. And if you mix up parts from each connecting rod and each piston, the weights of each of them, the actual physical weights of them, can cause your engine to be unbalanced. And this could be a source of vibration that causes these M104 blocks to crack. So making sure that your rotating assembly is as balanced as possible is a very good idea. That's why I made sure to keep everything in order like it was from the factory. The wrist pin retainers you want mostly facing down. So from straight down, 45 degrees to the left or to the right, so a 90 degree field of, of uh, pointing for the gap, that's roughly where you want the retainer gap facing. And to install these retainers, so you need to start one tip inside of the groove and then push in with your, with your finger and then have the other side of the gap towards the bottom of the piston where it's still sticking out. Then you can use a flathead screwdriver on the shoulder right there where the bottom of the piston is and you can actually pry against that to lift the retainer up into its hole and then once it's in you can push with your thumb to get it all the way into the hole and then a flathead screwdriver with just a light tap on top of the retainer will get it to seat into its groove. So now that we have our wrist pin retainers into the pistons, our pistons are assembled and ready to go into the engine block. So the first thing that we need to do before we put anything anywhere is we need to wipe out the cylinders in the engine block, make sure there's no dust in there. And then we need to wipe some motor oil into the cylinders and make sure they're lubricated and ready for our pistons to slide in. So for motor oil, I choose Pennzoil Ultra Platinum. A YouTuber named Project Farm he has a really good YouTube video on different kinds of motor oil, and Pennzoil Ultra Platinum came out on top next to Amsoil, and the Pennzoil is significantly cheaper, and so that's what I use in all of my vehicles uh, for, for all of my oil changes, and that's what I would have used here for this assembly, except I didn't have any laying around. So just a shout out to that, that's the best motor oil that I am aware of. And I also added some Lucas oil stabilizer, and in this case I used a synthetic oil stabilizer. But regardless, it's really good stuff, it helps to increase the lubricity of oil. I'm not going to describe the whole thing, but basically it just sticks around for a super duper long time without oil flowing. It's good for an engine that's going to be sitting for a while and then used here and there and sits for long periods of time. It's also going to be good for this rebuild because this engine's probably not going to be turned over for the next month or maybe a little bit longer and I want the oil lubrication to not dissipate over that time. Now putting the pistons into the block is a relatively straightforward process. You just want to make sure that your piston rings are still facing the correct direction. 
In my case, I took a little bit of motor oil and I, I put it into the ring grooves. I just used my fingers and kind of just swished around my fingers with oil on the rings to make sure everything's nice and lubricated. I lubricated the ring compressor tool, set it on top of the block, and then slowly slid the piston down into the tool and used my fingers to guide the rings into the piston and into the tool as it slid down. The hardest part is actually getting the piston to transfer from the tool into the block. And what I did is I used a combination of pressing on different spots of the piston with my thumbs and rocking the tool slightly, barely back and forth, just a hair, and also kind of using my knuckle to tap it in. Eventually I got all of the pistons in and it wasn't a problem. It was just a little bit of a hassle. With the pistons in, I flipped over the block and started on the large end of the connecting rods. So the process of installing the connecting rod bearings is almost identical to doing the main crank bearings. If you haven't seen me do that, definitely watch the video that I put in the card right here. Long story short, you just want to make sure that where the bearings are going to sit in the connecting rod, it's all dry. The back sides of the bearings are dry, the top sides of the bearings are dry, and the channel on the crankshaft where the bearings are going to sit is dry because if it's greased, then we're gonna get an improper bearing clearance reading with our plastic gauge. So in my case, I started off with cylinder one. So I install a bearing into the connecting rod for cylinder one, and then I also install the bearing into the cap for the connecting rod of cylinder one. Then I pulled the connecting rod and piston, I slid it up to the bearing journal on the crankshaft, and then I put a piece of plastic gauge over the majority of the bearing surface, or the bearing journal on the crankshaft, and then I put the cap over the top, then I took the connecting rod bolts and I dipped them in oil to make sure that the threads were lubricated, and I made sure to take the end of the bolt and smear it on the top shoulder of the connecting rod cap to make sure when the bolt is touching the face of the connecting rod cap, uh, there's no friction there that it's lubricated. And I'm using oil instead of anti-seize because this is going to be exposed to the inside of the engine. The back side of the connecting rod is open where the threads go through and I don't want anti-seize or thread lubricant ending up in the oil system. And then I torqued the bolts down to spec which is 30 newton meters plus 90 degrees and that's 22.2 foot pounds plus 90 degrees. Then I removed the bolts and checked my plastic gauge, and in my case, everything was within spec between 0.03 and 0.04 millimeters. I wasn't able to get super definitive information on the bearing clearance, but from what I understand, it needs to be between 0.02 and 0.05 millimeters, roughly. If you're outside of this, uh, you probably have a problem that you need to address. Then once I know that my bearing clearance is good, I push the connecting rod down and I lubricate it with engine assembly lube. I also lubricate the bearing journal on the crankshaft with assembly lube and then I also lubricate the bearing cap for the connecting rod and then I put it all back together, torque down to factory spec. Then you're free to rotate the crankshaft now that it's lubricated. Once all my connecting rods had been lubricated and bolted to the crankshaft. Then I took some motor oil and I poured it over the crank and let it kind of run down the connecting rods down to the pistons just so I can get everything nice and lubricated, make sure that there's nowhere that I could possibly be missing any lubrication. And then I rotated the crank a couple of times. I rotated the rotating assembly. Then I turned the engine block over and I pour a little bit of oil into where the pistons sit. And my goal with this is I kind of take the engine oil that's sitting in there and I swish it around to the edges and have it try to run across the rings and make sure that they're without a shadow of a doubt everything is perfectly lubricated especially with this Lucas oil stabilizer this stuff is really good stuff and then that's it we have our bottom end assembled we still need to put the splash guard or the baffle on we and the uh, oil pump and then we need to get the oil pan on but that's coming up later down the road. I just want to make sure before we bolt everything up together with gaskets and things that we already have all of our bases covered. And as always, if you guys are getting value out of this content, leave me a like and leave me a comment down below. And subscribe to see my upcoming stuff. It's going to be great, guys. And I'll see you next time.